Story Dramas, brought to you by Nelson Olmsted. Turn down the lights, relax, and prepare to enjoy a fine short story presented by NBC's outstanding narrator, Nelson Olmsted. Tonight, the story is by one of America's most colorful literary figures, Ambrose Bierce. The story, A Horseman in the Sky. And here is Nelson Olmsted. <laughs> One sunny afternoon in the autumn of the year 1861, a soldier lay in a clump of laurel by the side of a road in western Virginia. He lay at full length upon his stomach, his feet resting upon the toes, his head upon his left forearm. His extended right hand loosely grasped his rifle. But for the somewhat methodical disposition of his limbs and a slight rhythmic movement of the cartridge box at the back of his belt, he might have been thought to be dead. He was asleep at his post of duty. If detected, he would be dead shortly afterward, death being the just and legal penalty of his crime. The clump of laurel in which the criminal lay was in an angle of the road, which, after ascending southward at a steep incline to that point, turned sharply to the west, running along the summit for perhaps 100 yards. There it turned southward again, went zigzagging downward through the forest. At the salient of that second angle was a large flat rock, jutting out northward, overlooking the deep valley from which the road ascended. The rock capped a high cliff. A stone dropped from its outer edge would have fallen downward a thousand feet to the tops of the pines. The angle where the soldier lay was on another spur of the same cliff. Had he been awake, he would have commanded a view not only of the road and the jutting rock, but of the entire profile of the cliff below it. It might well have made him giddy to look. The configuration of the valley below was such that from this point of observation, it seemed entirely shut in, and one could only wonder how the road which found a way out of it had found a way into it, and whence came and whither went the waters of the stream that parted the meadow more than a thousand feet below. No country is so wild and difficult, but when will make it a theater of war. Concealed in the forest at the bottom of that military rat trap, in which half a hundred men in possession of the exits might have starved an army to submission, lay five regiments of federal infantry. They'd marched all the previous day and night and were resting. At nightfall, they would take to the road again, climb to the place where their unfaithful sentinel now slept, and descending the other slope of the ridge, fall upon the camp of the enemy at about midnight. Their hope was to surprise it, for the road led to the rear of it. In case of failure... Their position would be perilous in the extreme, and fail they surely would should accident or vigilance apprise the enemy of the movement. The sleeping sentinel in the clump of laurel was a young Virginian named Carter Drews. He was the son of wealthy parents and only child, and had known such ease and cultivation and high living as wealth and taste were able to command in the mountain country of western Virginia. His home was but a few miles from where he now lay. One morning, he'd risen from the breakfast table and said quietly but gravely, Father, a Union regiment has arrived at Grafton. I'm going to join it. The father lifted his linen head, looked at the son a moment in silence, and replied, Well, go, sir. And whatever may occur, do what you conceive to be your duty. Virginia, to which you are a traitor, must get on without you. Should we both live to the end of the war, we shall speak further of the matter. Your mother, as the physician has informed you, is in the most critical condition. At the best, she cannot be with us longer than a few weeks. But that time is precious. It would be better not to disturb her. So Carter Drews, bowing reverently to his father, who returned the salute with a stately courtesy that masked a breaking heart, left the home of his childhood to go soldiering. By conscience and courage, by deeds of devotion and daring, he soon commended himself to his fellows and his officers, 
And it was to these qualities, and to some knowledge of the country, that he owed his selection for his present perilous duty at the extreme outpost. Nevertheless, fatigue had been stronger than resolution, and he'd fallen asleep. Some good or bad angel came in a dream to rouse him from that state of crime. Without a movement, without a sound, he quietly raised his forehead from his arm and looked between the masking stems of the laurels, instinctively closing his right hand about the stock of his rifle. His first feeling was a keen, artistic delight. On a colossal pedestal, the cliff, motionless at the extreme edge of the capping rock and sharply outlined against the sky, was an equestrian statue of impressive dignity. The figure of a man sat on the figure of a horse, straight and soldierly, but with the repose of a Grecian god carved in the marble which limited its suggestion of activity. For an instant, Drews had the strange, half-defined feeling that he'd slept to the end of the war and was looking upon a noble work of art reared upon that eminence to commemorate the deeds of a heroic past of which he had been an inglorious part. The feeling was dispelled by a slight movement from the group. The horse, without moving its feet, had drawn its body slightly backward from the verge. The, the man remained immobile as before. A broad awake and keenly alive to the significance of the situation, Drews now brought the butt of his rifle against his cheek by cautiously pushing the barrel through the bushes, cocked the piece, and glancing through the sights, covered a vital spot in the horseman's breast. A touch upon the trigger and all would have been well with Carter Drews. At that instant, the horseman turned his head and looked in the direction of this concealed foeman, seemed to look into his very face, into his eyes, into his brave, compassionate heart. Is it then so terrible to kill an enemy in war, an enemy who has surprised a secret vital to the safety of oneself and comrades, an enemy more formidable for his knowledge than all his army for its numbers? Carter Drews grew pale. He shook in every limb, turned faint, and saw the statuesque group before him as black figures rising, falling, moving unsteadily in arcs of circles in a fiery sky. His hand fell away from his weapon. His head slowly drooped until his face rested upon the leaves in which he lay. This courageous gentleman and hardy soldier was near swooning from intensity of emotion. It was not for long. In another moment, his face was raised from the earth. His hands resumed their places in the rifle. His forefinger sought the trigger. Mind, heart, and eyes were clear. Conscience and reason sound. He could not hope to capture that enemy. To alarm him would but send him dashing to his camp with the fatal news. The duty of the soldier was plain. The man must be shot dead from ambush, without warning, without a moment's spiritual preparation, with never so much as an unspoken prayer he must be sent to his account. But no. There's a hope. He may have discovered nothing. Perhaps he's but admiring the sublimity of the landscape. Drews turned his head and looked downward into the valley. He saw creeping across the green meadow a sinuous line of figures of men and horses. Some foolish commander was permitting the soldiers of his escort to water their beasts in the open, in plain view from a dozen summits. Drews withdrew his eyes from the valley and fixed them again upon the group of men and horse in the sky. And again, it was through the sights of his rifle. But this time, his aim was at the horse. In his memory as if they were a divine mandate, rang the words of his father at their parting. Whatever may occur, do what you conceive to be your duty. He was calm now. His teeth were firmly but not rigidly closed. His nerves were as tranquil as a sleeping babe's. Not a tremor affected any muscle of his body. His breathing, until suspended in the act of taking aim, was regular and slow. Duty had conquered. In spirit had said to the body, Peace, be still. He fired. An officer of the Federal Force, in a spirit of adventure or in quest of knowledge, had left the hidden bivouac in the valley and with aimless feet had made his way to the lower edge of the open space near the foot of the cliff. Lifting his eyes to the dizzy altitude of its summit, the officer saw an astonishing sight. A man on horseback riding down into the valley through the air. Straight upright sat the rider in military fashion with firm seat in the saddle a strong clutch upon the rein to hold his charger from too impetuous a plunge. From his bare head, his long hair streamed upward, waving like a plume. His hands were concealed in the cloud of horse's lifted mane. The animal's body was as level as if every hoof stroke encountered resistant earth. Its motions were those of a wild gallop, but even as the officer looked, they ceased, with all the legs thrown sharply forward, as if in the act of alighting from a leap. 
But this was a flight. Filled with amazement and the terror by this apparition of a horseman in the sky, half believing himself the chosen scribe of some new apocalypse, the officer was overcome by the intensity of his emotions. His legs failed him and he fell. Almost at the same instant, he heard a crashing sound in the trees, a sound that died without an echo, and all was silent. A half hour later, this officer returned to camp. He was a wise man. He knew better than to tell an incredible truth. He said nothing of what he'd seen. But when the commander asked him if in his scout he'd learned anything of advantage to the expedition, he answered, Yes, sir. There's no road leading uh, down into this valley from the southward. The commander, knowing better, smiled. After firing his shot, Private Carter Drews reloaded his rifle and resumed his watch. Ten minutes had hardly passed when the federal sergeant crept cautiously to him on hands and knees. Drews neither turned his head nor looked at him, but lay without motion or sign of recognition. Did you fire? The sergeant whispered. Yes. At what? A horse. It was standing on that rock pretty far out. You see, it isn't there any longer. He went over the cliff. The man's face was white, but he showed no other signs of emotion. Having answered, he turned his eyes away and said no more. The sergeant didn't understand. See here, Drews, it's no use making a mystery. I order you to report. Was there anybody on the horse? Yes. Well? My father. The sergeant rose to his feet as he said, Good Lord in heaven. <laughs> This has been Ambrose Beer's short story, A Horseman in the Sky, as presented by Nelson Olmsted, who has some closing comments on tonight's program. Well, a Horseman in the Sky is from Ambrose Bierce's collection entitled In the Midst of Life. I think it's interesting to note that Bierce had great difficulty getting his first stories accepted. In a preface to the first edition of In the Midst of Life, Bierce wrote, Denied existence by the chief publishing houses of the country, this book owes itself to Mr. E.L.G. Steele, merchant of this city. In attesting Mr. Steele's faith in his judgment and friend, it will serve its author's main and best ambition. Signed, A.B., San Francisco, September 4th, 1891. Well, praise be to Mr. E.L.G. Steele, whoever he was, for possessing such foresight. Without his financial backing, many of our favorite beer stories might have been lost. Stories such as An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, The Applicant, and The Man, with, uh, and the Man and the Snake, all of which have been presented in story dramas. Beers' life itself reads like fiction, especially the end of it. In November 1913, he entered Mexico and was for a while on the staff of the insurgent Villa. But by January, all letters from him ceased. What happened to him is a great mystery. There are as many different stories about his death as there are people who knew him well in the days before his disappearance. Well, on Monday night, our story is by Charles Dickens, entitled The Signal Man. I hope you can be with us. Until Monday night, then, good night and good reading. NBC presents the outstanding narrator, Nelson Armstead, and his story dramas three nights each week at this same time over most of these same stations. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>